We are really in a dire situation, Republican or Democrat, it steams along. This government is dominated by the pharmaceutical industry, and if it wants a drug approved, it will get it, regardless of the consequences to the American people. When 50% of America has a chronic disease, something's wrong. It means we've failed at our health care system. It means we have a disease care system. Well, I don't think the public has begun to grasp the stranglehold of the pharmaceutical industry and the health insurance industry and the for-profit hospital industry and the nursing homes. Drugs that have been said to be too unsafe to approve by the FDA's own medical reviewers have been approved over their objections and entered into the market, causing the very harms they predicted. The FDA, in my opinion, has probably killed more Americans in this country than all the wars that the U.S. has ever fought combined. The drugs themselves cause death, disability, further symptoms, which typically are further treated with other drugs. As an ethical issue, they never think, gee, this is going to kill people, I shouldn't do it. The pharmaceutical companies have one objective. That is not the health and safety of the individuals of this country, but the almighty dollar. The bottom line, make it a buck. They're going to become chronically ill. They're going to become chronically depressed. That's the expected end. And that's why they will need to be on these drugs for life. We're not killing them quickly, but we're taking their lives away. The FDA approves unsafe medical devices, unsafe prescription drugs that harm Americans. And they spend any extra energy they have after approving drugs to go after natural product manufacturers to make sure that there is no competition to their client, the pharmaceutical industry. One of the oldest activities in the world is eliminating economic competitors. Food, clean, safe, natural food, and high-potency nutrients are the economic competitors to expensive, dangerous, patentable drugs. It's a war being fought in your body. We need to have a constitutional amendment. We need health freedom. We should have the right to choose the kind of care that we want. It's a corporate zeitgeist. It's much more profitable to fix things than to prevent things. It's much more profitable to chalk up hospital stays than to help people stay out of harm. Unfortunately, our Congress has not supported we the people. It's really looking at trying to support corporate America. We have to rethink our entire philosophical underpinnings. Actually, in a way, it means going back to the basic democratic principles that were set up when we started this experiment as a nation. We have a government at present that every member of which has sworn to uphold the Constitution. We are in deep crisis, not just for our poor health care, but for our democracy itself. We have to have a system of medicine where our patients are not being killed by the treatments. And unfortunately, today, they are being killed in such huge numbers that modern medicine as practiced in America today is a crime against humanity. How can you possibly as a human being be willing to sacrifice others' lives, particularly the lives of youth, in order to placate financial interests? We have a system of medicine that's broken that by itself is killing at least 700,000 people a year. Some people are dying since they don't have health insurance, but what about the number of people who are dying because of the current system? All the industrialized democratic countries have found a way to have universal health care sponsored and guaranteed by the government. $2.3 trillion, one-sixth of our whole gross domestic product, $7,200 for every person in this country, and twice as much as the next three countries in the world, Switzerland, France, Germany. We spend $7,200 per capita, they spend $3,200. All the measurements that we use to define good or bad in a health system, we are never near the top. Sometimes we're remarkably close to third world nations. This is not a privilege. It is a right that every human being, as a human being, has. And the healthcare system has to be organized in such a way that that is the guiding premise and not the transformation of healthcare 
into a, a commodity to be sold and a profit to be made on it. Like many people, I would love to see some form of universal health care that's focused on health and care, that's focused on real prevention. But we're not getting that because of the poisons that are being injected into people, even though they're called therapies, because of the disinformation that is given to patients by our drug companies and our misinformed physicians. The number of people dying from that dwarfs the numbers of Americans who sadly are dying from lack of care. Now, my daughter went to medical school 30 years ago and was taught as an incoming medical student that 50% of hospital admissions are due to iatrogenic diseases, doctor-caused diseases. In other words, the healthcare system was admitting in training new doctors that half the healthcare problems that they were going to be facing were caused, going to be caused by themselves. Our culture is replete with chronic disease. Every chronic disease is a massive profit producer for the people who produce drugs, every single one of them. These things exist not so much because they were allowed to exist as because they were created. So that it, you can call it ADD, you can call it obesity, whatever it is, when you have people who go from uh, the age of, uh, let's say, 15 to the age of 65 in a chronic depressed health situation, massive amounts of profit are made off each one of those individuals. About 100 years ago, things were really beginning to change in the United States. We were changing from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy. And these titans of industry really wanted to be able to control not only the United States, but the world financial system as a whole. When the Rockefellers took over the allopathic medicine, the Rockefellers were also in charge of the oil industry and the chemical industry. And they also made an alliance with a, a huge German concern called IG Pharma, which was a big uh, chemical industry in Germany. So there is an interplay between what was called the money power from the early part of the 20th century, who held board positions in many of these corporations. When the Rockefellers took over the medical schools, there were many types of medical education in the United States. There were homeopathic doctors and there were naturopathic doctors who were using natural medicines to heal, and they were having very good outcomes. Once the Rockefellers took over the system, they closed down those other schools and they only promoted the sale of their drugs, they promoted surgery, and they promoted radiation. Well, there's a um, kind of sociological theory about paradigm shift. And it goes uh, something like this. You have, let us say, um, the medical community, all the doctors in the United States. They are a community. And they have a kind of mythology which is supported by everybody believing the same thing. When you go to medical school, you're indoctrinated with this it's kind of religious dogma. So if the pharmaceutical industry profits by selling medicine, uh, but the industry profits by selling more and more of them, then the industry pays doctors to prescribe them and so on. We see a, a mafia-like monster has afflicted this community. So the Hippocratic Oath, the uh, ordinary altruism of people in a community is, uh, is subverted by this capitalistic pressure. This is the problem with the, not only the medicine people, but in all spheres of science. Uh, there is real vested interest in keeping the imperfect science because too much has been invested. And large systems have developed. It's like this $2.7 trillion uh, part of the economy that healthcare um, costs represent in this country. So this uh, investment uh, makes it the most difficult to change anything, especially to change the basic metaphysics. Because if we did that, then it would uh, turn out that the emperor is largely naked, and uh, we don't really need this expansive system. Medicine's invaluable. You'd never throw it away. I have the highest respect for the technologies, for the drugs when they're used appropriately. And for, the, and for the doctors themselves to want to do the right thing. But that's not the whole story. That's only what you use when it's necessary. 
those fantastic microsurgeries that are done by robots, the heart transplants and kidney transplants, all those things that we're doing, they're magical. Why would you throw it away? It's just that it's not the first thing we should use. It's the last thing we should use. And if we come to our senses, we look at lifestyle as the medicine that has always been the medicine we should have, and certainly the medicine of the future, we're going to be a healthy country. Now, if I was in trouble and I needed allopathic care, I wouldn't hesitate to get it. But there are many paths to health care, and a comprehensive approach to uh, health care must include um, integrative medicine, a complementary, alternative approach to medicine that would look at all the options. There are as many paths to help as there are individuals, uh, but we just focus on, on one path in particular, and that is the allopathic practice. But uh, practitioners will tell you that they're often limited in their means to treat uh, many types of, of ailments. We clearly need health care, there's no question, but the health care that we need is more on the acute traumatic health care, where we have services that are in, in phenomenal surgeons and neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons that can address the traumas that result from being involved in accidents that cannot be altered by traditional lifestyle approaches. So if we live in a culture and in a context that is forever handing us fears and handing us diseases and pathologies that we need to worry about, we begin to incorporate those into our worldview and into our model of ourselves. Many illnesses that we see today have kind of been trumped up or exaggerated in ways that promote the pharmaceutical industry or promote various ways in which there's profit built in rather than the kind of turning of the, the table and starting to look at social profit and social welfare. It's Christmas Eve, and we're so excited. He's made it to 50. <laughs> hope you make it another 50, Dave. We love you. Meet David and Cheryl Knight. They live in Washington State. And for over a decade, Cheryl has been plagued by the side effects of prescription drugs. Right now, though, it's Christmas 2007. And Merry Christmas to everyone. The Knights are about to enter a Kafkian nightmare, one that will kill David's father and put Cheryl into a mental hospital, all due to prescription drugs. And as for me, this is the year of the myofascial pain lockup. Yes, I'm seeing my physical therapist three times a week. We've made some progress, but we're still working on trying to relax muscles. We will hear their story in this documentary. Our life has turned to absolute hell on wheels. Not going to go through it. This is evil force in this room. My wife was prescribed clonopin and Ativan for chronic pain and muscle spasms. It's been about eight months, and we are experiencing a living hell. <laughs> Doctors are not willing to help. The more I get on the internet, the more I read, the more nauseated I become. So we are trying to take her off here at home. She is, quotes, off the clonopin at this point. Of course, whether she's still having withdrawals from that is anybody's guess. And we have okay. tried to taper the Ativan about one fourth of the dose. I'm going to document this event. Um, I'm going to film her and I'm going to show you what this is like to go through if for some reason we as a family don't make it through you'll know why one friend of mine went to Harvard Business School and on his very first day in class they were given a test case uh, that you're a drug company and uh, a couple of people have died from your over-the-counter drug. What do you do? Do you recall the drug? Do you calculate the damages? What? And, and my friend, who didn't know yet uh, how things operated in this school, immediately said, recall the product. And everybody laughed in the room, and the teacher said, have you calculated how many lives you can afford to lose before you need to recall? When someone dies by iatrogenic causes, it means that the healthcare system itself is actually the cause of the death. Too many people are being harmed by the products that the industry is putting forth. When a drug is put on the market, there's a, they call it a cost-benefit ratio. How much harm is it going to do against how much good it's going to do? But the question is, how many people do we have to harm in order to get the good? If 
pharmaceutical companies lobby Congress directly. They lobby decision makers and influence policy decisions. The pharmaceutical industry doesn't stop there. The pharmaceutical industry also through direct-to-consumer advertising creates a demand for their products with oftentimes misleading ads. When you get a delusion running, when society starts embracing a story that there are these chemical imbalances, and then they, they start saying, well, kids have them, teenagers have them, and they keep, they're, they're, they start believing that these drugs are fixing something wrong. Then the story, it just continues to get more and more out of control as financial forces try to keep on expanding the market for those drugs. So what do we end up with? We end up with people at major academic centers trying to tell us that two-year-olds and three-year-olds can be diagnosed, quote, with bipolar disorder and can benefit from being put on antipsychotic medications. And no other society is doing it. Everybody else thinks it's ludicrous. No one believes really it's going to end up well. We're killing the kids. We're not killing them quickly, but we're taking their lives away. And that's what we should admit we're doing, and we're doing it for capitalistic reasons. It's a capitalist story. It's a story about expanding the market for psychiatric drugs. One thing that a lot of parents don't want to admit is just what a nuisance kids are. Get in, it gets in the way of, uh, of the life that they want to live and lead. And Now, if you're from the working class and you're poor, uh, you're having, both parents are having to work. And, so, um, uh, and sometimes more than one job, each of these parents. And so it's very difficult to be able to do the job of raising the kids. And the pharmaceutical companies and the doctors have found a convenient way uh, to prescribe pills so that uh, 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 these people can continue to work uh, lousy jobs for little pay where they're overworked, they don't get paid for overtime, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, don't worry about your kids because, uh, you know, they're okay. They're properly medicated. Uh, they'll behave themselves. One of, the, one of the problems with the, the, the DSM is so much jockeying uh, in terms of getting new disorders into the manual, in part because the manual has an extraordinary, I think, un, unmerited uh, authority. Something like passive aggressive personality disorder is characterized by dawdling over doing laundry and groceries. I mean, factors like that are actually published in that scientific quote unquote manual. Um, uh, they uh, have listings under oppositional disorder for children, including negativistic, disobedient, and ineffective. I mean, that's actually there, ineffective as a child. What does that mean? Drug companies literally monitor what is taught and influence, if not control, what is taught in medical schools. Drug companies also sponsor much of medical school research. So the research budget is derived from drug companies. Many, many years ago, the federal government used to fund research at medical schools, but now more and more of that research is actually funded directly by medical schools themselves. Big pharmaceutical companies are not so much eager to cure people because then they won't need their medicines, but to keep people alive and slightly sick, but in a curable way. And this is at least the best way. If they die, they're out of the picture. If they're healthy, they're out of the picture. They have to be slightly sick so that they constantly will need medis medication to make themselves feel at least healthier. Today we have Big Pharma, and they say all hope is in this little pill. And if you take this, you're going to be well. Well, the fact of the matter is that, well, America's uh, tremendous uh, consumption of pharmaceuticals uh, occurs in quantum leaps every year. The fact of the matter is that our health care costs keep going up. So maybe those drugs, which in some cases can provide relief to people, maybe they're not the only solution. On 9-11, we lost 3,000 people. Every year in this country, we've lost 100, over 100,000 people to pharmaceutical drugs. That means we've lost over a million people to the pharmaceutical industry in the nine years since 9-11. And yet, we're not chasing pharmaceutical terrorists all over the world. Do we really live in a rational time that the killing of a million people is just a ho-hum kind of event? I think we need to reorder our priorities. There's going to come a day where we are all, all of us, adults and children alike, are diagnosed with at least one disorder, maybe up to a dozen disorders, and we are put on mandatory medications. And if we disagree with that, 
they'll say we suffer from obedience defiance disorder and we'll be put on a different set of drugs to treat that disorder or we'll be thrown in jail until we agree to take those drugs. It's that crazy. Another piece of the puzzle is the drug rep. And this would be the lady in the high heels, very short and tight skirt, who comes to doctor's offices and hands out goodies. The companies are hiring reps that really have no science or medical background. They are not doctors, typically. They are not pharmacists. They are not nurses. They are some, they're oftentimes business majors and music majors and drama majors. And they're telling your doctors how to prescribe drugs to you, the patient. And they are given sales goals. They are to call on doctors to explain the drugs and how the other drugs might not be so helpful to get the doctor to take these samples and to prescribe these drugs. Now, when a doctor writes a prescription, that prescription is entered into a database. This information is sold to the drug companies who then use it to give to the drug reps. And so if you are a, dr a doctor who's prescribing a lot of the drug, that drug rep is instructed to give you expensive gifts. If your profile falls off, it's also the drug rep that is sent to your office to give you a dressing down. So then you have drug rep as disciplinarian. I was being told to minimize side effects, that I was disseminating misinformation and disinformation campaigns. I knew that I was not giving fair, balanced information to doctors, therefore doctors couldn't give fair, balanced information to their patients. So I started being disheartened while I was still in the industry about the industry itself because I knew that the job that I was originally taxed to do, that that wasn't what my job was anymore, that my job was a marketing job, that I was there to, to build the bottom line of the company, that I was there to grow market share and influence physicians' prescribing habits. While I was a pharmaceutical sales representative, when we were interacting with physicians, uh, we were constantly trying to downplay side effects, minimize side effects, um, if those questions were raised by the physician. And we were trained to skillfully sidestep those questions um, and to not provide uh, full disclosure about the potential devastating effects of, of certain medications. Um, many medications do not have severe long-term crippling side effects, but, but others do. And unfortunately and ironically, that's what happened to me. Uh, I've been uh, suffering from disabling symptoms now for many years from an antibiotic called Levaquin, which is a fluoroquinolone antibiotic uh, that has a black box warning uh, associated with its use. And despite that warning, it's still being prescribed uh, indiscriminately and without warning to patients. And many people are, are losing their, their jobs, uh, they're losing their homes, family, because of the devastating and crippling side effects of Levaquin and Cipro and other fluoroquinolone antibiotics. And I think it's criminal that these drugs are still being prescribed as a first line of treatment for minor infections. Levaquin and Cipro and other fluoroquinolone antibiotics should be reserved for serious and life-threatening infections. I was very grateful that I had the experience and knowledge that I did about the psychiatric drugs that I had sold because I identified these were drug reactions. So I knew that as my mental state was deteriorating, that it wasn't me, that I wasn't crazy, you know, this was not, this was mediated by the drugs that I had taken, and so I just kept clinging to the fact that I had to have a washout, that I had to detoxify the body from the drug, and so I begged my husband and I begged several of my closest friends to not put me in a mental institution because I had, you know, visited them in my career, and I knew that once that I got behind those closed doors of that mental institution, that they could do anything they wanted to, including electroshock therapy. So I knew that my recovery depended on the detoxification of my body. And I knew that if I got into the hospital, a detoxification would not be offered to me. I would be pumped full of any kind of drug that they needed in order to, you know, keep me quiet or to restrain me. So it actually took me a period of 12 years to completely detoxify my body and to get back to some semblance of normalcy to where I felt like I was before I had the adverse event. The other thing that happens with drug reps is that they present data to the doctor that may not be entirely truthful. And 
this was seen with uh, OxyContin, the pain drug, where drug reps told doctors, these are not addictive. This is different. This is not your run-of-the-mill narcotic. This is the one narcotic known to man that your patient will not get addicted to. And it literally touched off an OxyContin epidemic throughout the United States. Our drug is clearly the most efficaciousest. Vivex offers your patients unsurpassed clinical efficacy. Proven efficacy. This is absolutely the most efficacious drug your patients can use. <laughs> My wife has had TMJ. Her front teeth did not actually come together. She had a lot of pain. We went to her primary doctor. He started uh, giving her Vicodin for pain control. We didn't want a drug intervention, but that was what was basically forced upon her. Basically, she got put on benzodiazepines and Neurontin, uh, Vicodin ES, eventually on Abilify, Remeron, Venlafaxine, Vistral just a real cocktail of drugs. And of course, our experience is that uh, in the process of finally discovering that the drugs could be the problem, we uh, tried to start a uh, taper program at home because I couldn't get the doctors to do it for me. We learned about half-lives. We learned about uh, the potency uh, of these super benzos now that are many, many times stronger than Valium ever was. We learned what it was like to try to relate to the medical community. They keep wanting to, to tell you that you have an underlining problem. They never want to look at the drugs as a possible cause of it. We had an argument with the final doctor as to the speed at which she was going to come off these drugs. I went ahead and said, OK, that's fine. If you think you can get her off in eight weeks, that's fine. But I think you're going to crash her. Well, he crashed her. She probably was 24 hours from, from dying. We took her to the hospital, and she was whisked off to a psych ward. Uh, at that point, they just introduced all kinds of psychotropic drugs, neuroleptics, antipsychotics, and antidepressants. They wanted to do electroconvulsive shock therapy, and we absolutely refused. They moved her to the state mental hospital, and I followed her in the camper, and I was by her side for three months, and I made sure she saw me every single day, sometimes several times a day, so she wouldn't be afraid. And I just watched this horrible deterioration process. I went in and talked to the doctors, I said, you need to give her a drug holiday. She's been on drugs for three years now. I know it's the drugs. We were finally able to get her released. Got a homeopathic doctor. We finally got her off of drugs completely a year ago. So now today we're about 13 months off the drugs. Um, we're seeing a stock market recovery. It's up and down. And you can, you can think you're making progress one week. The next week, you know, she's back into pen. You have to wake up. You you can't just take the pill. You can't take that purple pill. You know that that Prilosec or that that other acid blocking drug, uh, and go eat the whole pizza and think it's okay. A particularly egregious drug that the FDA allowed to come onto the market was called Ketek, K-E-T-E-K. -E -E it was supposed to be used for antibiotic resistant infections. Unfortunately, it promoted liver failure. It turns out that the studies that were done to validate the safety weren't done. In fact, the doctor who was overseeing these studies uh, received $400 per patient uh, and enrolled 400 fictitious people into these studies and showed that, of course, none of these people had any adverse effects from Ketek because, of course, these people didn't exist. Now here's where the story really gets bad. Even after the FDA discovered that the data submitted to them by the company was fraudulent, they still presented it to the congressional investigative committees. The result was the media picked up on this and proclaimed that this drug was shown to be safe in all these studies, studies that never occurred. So the drug Ketek, when it first came out, by the way, was selling for over $1,000 for 60 tablets. And it's now come down to $285. The company's reduced the price. The FDA allows that drug to stay on the market. Bayer has known for years that, it, that its drug, Traosol, had all kinds of complications involving kidney shutdown. And Bayer did a study with 67,000 patients. Bayer 
failed to give their own internal data to the FDA. And before that, Bayer manufactured a blood product called Factor IX. That drug was contaminated with HIV, and an entire generation of hemophiliacs will die of AIDS and HIV. They went to Skid Row to buy blood to use for the manufacture of this product. This company positively, absolutely knew that they had a medication that was infected with the AIDS virus. They took the product off the market in the U.S. and then they dumped it in France, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. So they made a huge profit. By the way, Joe, government officials in France that allowed that to happen actually had to go to prison for it. In America, not one corporate executive for this company has been indicted or even criminally investigated by our Justice Department. Why not? I filed to the FDA what's called a Freedom of Information Act request, and I received from the FDA these reports. For Levaquin, there's been over 1,000 deaths associated with the drug. Uh, I've also filed one for Cipro that shows that there's been over 1,000 deaths associated with Cipro. The pharmaceutical industry and the FDA know that these drugs have been crippling people for months, years, or permanently, and they do nothing about it. The FDA actually had to be sued by a consumer advocacy group called Public Citizen to put the black box warning on these drugs. It was known in, certainly by 1985, that all cases of polio in Mexico, United States, and Canada were exclusively due to the vaccine, that stopping the use of the oral polio vaccine as early as 1985 would have prevented all the polio cases that have occurred since. So what happened? Even though this was known, oral polio vaccine continued to be given. Why? Well, the company still had unused polio vaccine. In Bowling for Columbine, uh, we never really came up with the answer in terms of why this happened. All the reasons that were given or a bunch of BS. You know, Marilyn Manson caused them to do it. Uh, this, this, or that caused them to do it. And none of it really made any sense. That's why I believe there should be an investigation in terms of what pharmaceuticals, prescribed pharmaceuticals, these kids were on. It's an extremely legitimate question to pose, and it demands uh, an investigation. Aspirin kills about 1,500 people a year. Glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate kill zero people per year. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories kill a minimum of 25,000 people a year. When safe, effective, inexpensive alternatives are available that actually promote health, why would anybody use deadly chemicals that are expensive? and sure to cause bleeding and other uh, serious side effects and even death because the information is demonized and suppressed on an economic basis. Let's tell you the truth about mammography. It is a profit-making operation, scientifically ill-based, and women are being sold a bill of goods. Now, a mammogram, one mammogram on the other hand, is 0.2 rads, which is 200 millirads. In other words, it's 200 times the dose of a chest X-ray. So what uh, this amounts to is a premenopausal woman getting two mammograms over a 10-year period will be getting roughly the same radiation dosage as a Japanese woman one mile away from the, where the Hiroshima and the atom bomb was exploded. This is so painful. Oh, it just seems like there's no end. To the withdrawals, hardly any break. <laughs> well, that's what the literature says, so you kind of have to hang in there. You're going to have some good times, though. Oh. I, 
up so soon. <laughs> okay. I can't tell you, just don't tire of this mi misery every, every, every hour. Oh, it seems like all day and all night. Are you light sensitive? You keep squinting. Is it like you can't take the light? Yeah, it's just, oh, when somebody touches me, I just, the burning is sensitive, and light is sensitive, sounds are sensitive. Do you know what day it is? Oh, I think it's Tuesday. Bingo. Oh, good, I got it right. Oh, such pain, but oh, right here, my shoulder, oh, neck, jaw. I'm gonna try to stretch your muscles, okay, pretty soon? Oh, a little bit later, right now. It's too painful to touch. Right now, I have to wait till the withdrawal subsides some. Over $1 billion in the last decade has been spent lobbying the Congress of the United States by the pharmaceutical industry. That money has gone to Republicans and Democrats alike. People can still end up with insurance policies that leave them with huge deductibles and huge co-pays. They end up either deterred from going and seeking appropriate treatment at an early time when they can really manage it at a more cost-effective way or save their own lives. It, it really is a troubling, troubling way to handle the system. Why did we do that? Essentially because the health insurance industry is so powerful at the level of lobbying in the, in the United States. There are so many lobbyists, up to four lobbyists for each member of Congress related to the health care industry in this country. It's big money, and that big money talks. Every now and then, with a thud of a body, is some outspoken, angry family that says, hey, you know what, I think the drugs killed him. I think he died from therapy. So what happens when a person runs to their political leader and says, hey, I think my loved one has been harmed and this has got to stop? Well, lobbyist has already been there. And the lobbyist, as amazing as the gifts the doctor might seem, politicians get even bigger ones. Many of us Americans underestimated the enormous power of the corporate lobby on health care. It was a double whammy of barriers to change because you have giant health insurance companies that make an enormous amount of money out of the privatized, dysfunctional, expensive system that they, that they benefit from. And you have pharmaceutical companies, also very big, very big contributors to political campaigns, also with a vested interest against change. Why it is that every attempt on the part of political leadership to get something better going in health care, um, even funding children to get health care and things like that, and it's always turned down, is because we have an extraordinarily powerful lobby system in Washington. The best way to describe the power that the lobbyists wield in Congress is to look at what happened with the Medicare Prescription Drug Act. This is so significant from the standpoint that drug companies are overcharging for their medications to the extent that they're charging the public 100 times more than what it cost them to make it. So the lobbyists go to Congress and they write a bill, literally the Prescription Drug Act uh, that, that was passed was written by the pharmaceutical industry they present it to various members of Congress and they say, please pass this bill so that we can use tax dollars to pay these outlandish prices of these prescription drugs. Unfortunately, the impetus behind passing that bill was, were lobbyists. And it is outrageous that legislation of that importance, as well as most other legislation, passed in Washington is influenced to such a degree by the lobbyists whose only objective is for the big business who is generally behind most of the important and wide-sweeping legislation that is passed. It used to be the case that many of our Washington politicians came out of the legal profession, and uh, I'm sure people have noticed that nowadays they seem to come out of businesses. 
and uh, that's no accident. So today, if you want to know who's in control of the system, you have to look at who are the people at the top of the pharmaceutical industry. You have to look at the people who run the, who come in and out of the federal government. For example, who becomes chairman of the CDC? Who becomes chairman of the Department of Health and Human Services? Where do they get these people from? Uh, so the question is not so much who is in control, but what is the system that they've created? Because now they have a revolving door of people who come in and out of the system who pretty much uh, agree with how the system is working and they're not going to really change or do anything to the system that might offend it. Most politicians, in fact I would say all politicians except maybe for a unique few here and there, are trapped inside a system where their ability to hold their jobs, hold their office, depends on having the support of the system that's creating all the problems that we have. There is a belief that the legislative and judicial process that we have that creates our laws is there to protect the public. And that's not correct. That isn't why they came into existence. That's not what they're designed to do. At the end of the day, politicians have their constituents, hopefully, but certainly themselves and their reelection uh, in mind when they are uh, receiving uh, funds for uh, issues for entities that have a, a role to play in terms of determining uh, legislation as it relates to health care. And so Congress has become really a threat to the health and the safety of the American people. This may sound radical, but in America, people are concerned about terrorism and they're concerned about threats from abroad. Those threats pale in comparison to the threat that is posed by our own Congress working in conspiracy with the pharmaceutical industry to deny us access to real health, to real truthful information about the natural remedies and cures that can turn our health around and save our nation from a medical bankruptcy. I want to go back to the premise that we've got to get public decision making into public hands, that is into listening to the citizen and therefore as far as removed as it might sound to talk about doctors and medicine from this angle, I would say that a very direct health concern is the influence of private industry over all of our public decision making. And there is a way to, to remove that through elections that are funded publicly by citizens, not by corporations. One of the principal challenges, as I see it, is in the context of education. The educational system for health professionals has been so mechanistic, so deterministic, uh, so reductionistic, that we've lost sight of the integrity of the whole. We find that economics plays an enormously large and distorting role in everything from the very subjects that are taught and researched in medical schools. The treatments that physicians are encouraged to use with their individual patients, all the way through to the social political scale where we find that drug companies are able to make enormous contributions to influence healthcare systems. Drug companies literally monitor what is taught and influence if not control what is taught in medical schools. Drug companies also sponsor much of medical school research. The research budget, a lot of it, is derived from drug companies. The federal government used to fund research at medical schools, but now more and more of that research is actually funded directly by medical schools themselves, and this has definite repercussions. We know that Big Pharma spends 60 billion dollars a year on medical research, and we know that the National Institutes of Health only spends 25 billion and they have a close relationship with one another, which is why you're seeing research being directed towards technology and towards drugs. You're not seeing it directed towards the natural things that don't cost much, that don't provide much profit. So we have a huge conflict of interest there. The fact that a lot of this research is going on and a lot of FDA approvals are based on this research, a lot of physician medical practices are based on this research, explains why these drugs that look so good on paper with such good research behind them have such devastating effects, even deadly effects. 
when used in human beings. They're making their point of view from their perspective. And it's a very biased point of view that sometimes is outright lies and sometimes written by ghostwriters. So they may pay people to be involved with the study. They may have little to do with the study. It may be a very prominent person in the medical standing. And it doesn't change the fact that if they're paid enough money, the ghostwriters come in and write what they want to and slant it the way that they want to. You know, we're a year off the drugs. I can go to bed, right? This is what I've noticed, uh, a dementia, just a really bad cognitive decline. It's loud and it's ugly and it's, it doesn't make sense. It makes it horribly difficult to try to get through a night's sleep. Why? Why is it? I didn't mean to say it. You know, I try to isolate myself. Sometimes I have to go to the camper. She'll come up and bang on the door, and I know she is out of her mind. <laughs> I think this is still benzodiazepine recovery. I really do. The aggression, the outbursts, those are all on the symptoms list, and this is after you're off the drugs. But what makes this really, really hard is as the time goes by, and we're pushing a year now, the longer you get away from good. the drugs, that was a good one. the more of an yeah, argument there is that this is a, an underlying serious mental illness. And if you succumb to that and accept that, then back into a mental institution. Another piece of the puzzle is the federal agencies. And that would be the CDC, the FDA, Public Health Service. The FDA is a Food and Drug Administration, and many citizens believe that the Food and Drug Administration's major reason for existence was to keep our foods and drugs safe. There is absolutely no question who the FDA works for. They represent the interests of the drug companies, and they viciously attack anyone who presents a challenge to that. If a company has a natural product backed by good scientific knowledge, the FDA will attack them. And the better your product works, the more aggressively you'll be attacked. You will be threatened with being arrested and thrown in jail. You'll have your products confiscated, your company shut down. The owners of these companies are so terrified that they won't speak out publicly about what's happening. Behind closed doors, they are being forced to sign consent decrees where you must agree to admit that you're committing crimes even though you've never committed a crime. You've only told the truth about an herb or a nutrient or even a dried fruit like cherries. You've told the truth about it and you have been targeted by the FDA as a criminal. Now at 10, just one day after a raid on his farm, a local man goes back to selling raw milk. A Loganville dairy farmer is ignoring the state's orders to stop selling raw milk. Wednesday, state inspectors raided the farm with a search warrant. While serving the warrant, they not only put tags and tape on the coolers inside the store, they came and poured a dye inside the tank. Hershberger promptly started selling again this morning. <laughs> I think uh, the FDA is part and parcel here of the, of the problem. What is it in, what's in it for the FDA in terms of wanting to always try to block new or alternative ways uh, for people to get better? To have it revealed the vested interest and the hand-in-hand -hand relationship that exists between the FDA and the pharmaceutical companies, uh, I think the American people are finally catching on to this and this is going to, I think, going to blow the roof off this whole thing. The Food and Drug Administration is a captive of the pharmaceutical industry. It's absolutely transparently clear, and it is the subject of numerous whistleblowers' testimony to Congress. FDA medical reviewers have time and again identified drugs as causing severe adverse effects and have warned against approval, and their opinions have been squelched. They've been punished. They've, they've had uh, criminal investigations commenced against them, political witch hunts. They have had their science taken from them and censored. They've been denied the right to communicate at public conferences. There are numerous problems with the drug review process, but it originates from one simple reality, that the drug industry influences to an extraordinary degree the uh, review and approval of drugs. The drug, Premarin, 
uh, which so many uh, menopausal women were prescribed, uh, Premarin and Prempro, uh, those drugs caused so many cases of breast cancer, so many unnecessary heart attacks and strokes, and yet the FDA stills, still allows those drugs to be sold. There are safer forms of estrogen available. We don't need to have those drugs sitting on the pharmacy shelf anymore. They should be withdrawn from the marketplace, but they generate so much money for the maker of those drugs that they stay on the pharmacy shelf. And the maker of those drugs lobbies the FDA to suppress the ability of companies who make safer, more natural forms of estrogen from promoting that to the public. The FDA's uh, deputy director of the Office of Drug Safety, David Graham, has repeatedly stated that there's this undue influence that essentially he who pays the piper calls the tune. I would argue that the FDA as currently configured is incapable of protecting America against another Vioxx. We are virtually defenseless. It is important that this committee and the American people understand what had hap that what happened with Vioxx is really a symptom of something far more dangerous to the safety of the American people. Simply put, FDA and the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research are broken. When I appeared before the Senate Finance Committee and announced to the world that FDA was incapable of protecting America from unsafe drugs or from another Vioxx, FDA is responsible for 140,000 heart attacks, 60,000 dead Americans. That's as many people as were killed in the Vietnam War. Within the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, about 80% of the resources are geared towards the approval of new drugs. And 20% is for everything else. Drug safety is about 5%. Congress has created that structure by uh, Purdue for the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, by which drug companies pay money to FDA so that FDA will review and approve its drugs. For industry, every day that a drug is held up from being marketed, uh, in their minds, that's another one to two million dollars of profit that they're being denied. And so the incentive is really review the drugs as quickly as possible, approve them as quickly as possible, and don't stand in the way of our making profit. There's a strong bias in favor of approval. In the case of Vioxx, for example, they had a meeting with then uh, FDA Commissioner Lester Crawford, and these scientists urged him to take action against this drug and get it off the market. What did he do? He said the information was all anecdotal. He announced that he would approve the drug for pediatric use. And what happened to Lester Crawford when he left the FDA? He failed to reveal his ownership interests in large food companies and some pharmaceutical companies. This was discovered. There were investigations that took place. And so he came up on federal charges, and he resigned as commissioner of the FDA. He was going to be prosecuted, and he struck a deal and avoided a prison term. And then what happened to him? Well, he went to work for a lobbying firm in Washington that is one of the lobbying firms for Merck, the company that made Vioxx, and he makes an extremely handsome salary. Here is a person who was responsible for decisions that imperiled the lives and indeed actually cost the lives of human beings. And he is not penalized for this. Uh, he's not subject to any criminal prosecution for what he did. Instead, he's rewarded handsomely. <laughs> Increased levels of IGF-1, or insulin-like growth factor 1, in the RBGH milk were responsible for major increases in different cancers. Now, this information I supplied to FDA Commissioner von Eschenbach in 2007. He ignored it. Together with other leading national experts, I supplied this information to Margaret Hamburg, Commissioner of the FDA, and she ignored it. So here we have Margaret Hamburg, um, FDA commissioner, being told that RBGH milk will increase risks of breast, colon, and prostate cancers and not doing anything about it. Isn't this enough to dismiss her from her job immediately? And yet, she's still in her office. So we're dealing with a commissioner, FDA commissioners, which in this regard and in other regards which I could document, have shown themselves to be recklessly irresponsible. What kind of a democracy are we in when commercial interests 
industri industry interests, take precedence of a public health, even when life is threatened, even when there are avoidable risks of cancer? What kind of Alice in Wonderland situation are we in? Boy, the food is scrumptious. <laughs> My father, he was an amazing man. He was an artist, had a wonderful singing voice, played the violin, uh, was an outdoorsman. He and I were the best of friends. Um, after the house fire that killed my mom, we brought him up here. So we got him up here to Washington, and I, I said to my wife, I said, you know, um, he hasn't had a chat up in a long time. We need to take him down and, and, and get a good doctor and, and say, I have a good workup, make sure he's doing all right. Oh, man, I, I regret that in, in so many ways. But we went down, and they did a full blood panel and everything else, and lo and behold, they says, you know, he's got pre-diabetes. Not full-blown diabetes, just kind of borderline, but um, I'm an aggressive doctor, and I like, to, I like to treat things, you know, before they get out of hand, so we want to put him on metformin, and it wasn't too long before he uh, started having a really difficult time breathing. Uh, we thought he was going to congestive heart failure, and so we had to get a cardiologist, and they took a look at it and said, well, he, he's having heart problems and he has atrial fibrillation. I didn't know what the metformin did. Now since then I realize that metformin can cause those very same symptoms. Um, so they put him on a protocol which included blood thinners and warfarin and he, he was on a, a package of things uh, including Digitech. I went to the doctor and he says I don't know if this metformin started this whole mess but I said I don't think he's really diabetic and we're, we're, we're testing him every day and he's, he's well within good limits and so they took him off the metformin. And his heart seemed to get better. We come down to 2008, that's when they recalled Digitech. And of course, I became alarmed. I said, boy, if they're double dosing him, no wonder he doesn't have any energy, no wonder his heart was slow, it bradycardia, he was having all kinds of problems. And so um, I talked to the doctor and I says, should we just come off this? I mean, they recalled it and she says, she was just really, she says, well, I wouldn't worry about it. She says, I think we'll discontinue it, but I don't think there'll be any problems with it. Of course, it was, it was only a month or two after that that he died of a fatal arrhythmia. And, uh, you know, we're in a class action suit right now um, with about 400 other people just in this one law firm. So there's no question uh, that that drugs, that particular drug most likely ended his life. I've gotten his lab reports and it said digoxin toxicity and we were never told by the doctors. you look at the literature that comes out of the research and you look at the, the say the Lancet or the New England Journal of Medicine those are the, the big journals and all of those journals have to be financed and how do they get financed they get financed by the drug companies so the drug companies basically are very involved in financing medical research and the problem with that is this they're not disinterested parties they are interested in having an outcome that will show that their particular product is a workable product. And this, of course, has led to disastrous consequences, which we know because it has been widely reported that over 100,000 people every year are killed by one of these pharmaceutical products. Now, if you look at any of these journals, it doesn't matter which, you will see incredible ads from the drug companies. When you see an ad from the drug company, Look at the article that follows it, and notice the article actually pertains to that particular drug. You'll also see that the researchers who did the article, more likely than not, have listed in their disclosure that they received funding, a grant, if you will, from the maker of the drug advertised on the prior page. And so then, this journal, the American Medical Association, any medical journal you care to look at, is simply an advertising document, not much more or less than a glossy catalog advertising these drugs. When the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine came out and indicated that 
there needs to be much more oversight in terms of who's publishing the article and where does the support come from. No one really cares. It's good to examine the relationship that's developed between America's doctors, who after all are the ones who prescribe the medicine, and America's drug company. And it is a dangerous, corrupt evolution. Today, drug companies spend literally tens of millions of dollars to influence physician choices. And there is an obvious degradation of uh, physician responsibility, ethics, in putting the patient's interest ahead of anything else, which is part of the physician uh, credo. That is, is very, very undermined. The amount of money that's spent is staggering. And most people are shocked when they find out how much Big Pharma spends on each individual doc doctor per year. And this is well documented in our literature. That number comes to $61,000 per doctor per year. All of a sudden, doctors are working for corporations. And what they're going to be allowed to do is going to be dictated by them. Or if you're a physician and you decide for whatever reason that you have a better way, that these three protocols really are not going to do the trick, that you know that if you just told them to eat differently, take a couple of vitamins, they'd do a whole lot better. If you did that, then because you deviated from protocols, you were risking loss of license, uh, legal prosecution, loss of hospital privileges. And these protocols can literally cause you to be treated to death by being exposed to hazardous tests unrelated to your condition, um, hazardous medications that have no hope of improving your condition. So the doctor literally is obligated to provide you with this thing called the standard of care, which may actually result in your demise. One of the driving forces behind this trauma that physicians suffer is the lack of cooperation from the insurance companies. And this applies not only the, to the physicians, but also to the patients. For example, many times I might spend an hour with a patient and I might refer the patient for some treatment that they need, and the insurance company will completely deny it. I won't even get paid a single penny. I have received a check of 12 cents from uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. And what did I do with this check? They're framed and they're lying in my office. And you have a breakdown right now in the primary care practice. You have people running to specialists who prescribe their medication for that person's symptom, ignores the other medications the person is already on. And we have people who are being over-medicated, over-medicated to the extent that they are poisoning themselves and they don't realize that. Another complex piece in the puzzle as to why it takes $2.3 trillion to prematurely kill over 800,000 Americans. Another piece is the AMA, that would be the American Medical Association. It was just about dead in the water by the turn of the century. And it was the drug companies that breathed life into the AMA, literally bankrolled it. Um, to establish an organization that they could act through to give them more control over physicians. And this is essentially issues like the um, insurance issues, doctor reimbursement issues, um, medical practice issues, takes positions that are totally opposed to the better interests of physicians. So much so that many doctors have refused to even be a member of the AMA. I have not renewed my AMA membership for years. AMA should be the voice for physicians and should be the voice for better health and better care of the patients. I have no idea what's wrong. I believe it's all politically driven and they are incompetent. It's me, Dave. I can't function. It's not you. It's the damn it's drugs. Me. It's the drugs. It's me. I can't function. No. You know, this is, this is hell. This is torment every day. Someone's suffering every day. You're not mentally ill. <laughs> You are not mentally ill. <laughs> I don't have to wait to think if or see if I'm going to go to hell. This is hell. I don't know. This is withdrawals. And withdrawals make you, you seem like you're ill. And so, going to sleep doesn't sound all that bad, does it? Don't say that to a health professional. I'm not going to take it. I can't. Why do people commit suicide? I can see why they can commit suicide. As an administrator, we're taught that medicine, remember, is in fact a business.
and we're there to perpetuate that business. We don't really have incentive to make people well. Our incentive is to keep bringing in chronically ill people, treat them with what we've been indoctrinated to treat them with, which is synthetic drugs, radiation, or surgery, send them home, and keep them coming back over and over and over again until they finally die. And so the hospital has to make sure that this patient receives a certain type of care or level of care consistent with the diagnosis if they're going to get paid. The hospital purchases very expensive equipment, whether it's a CAT scanner, a PET scanner, and in order to make back the money to pay the cost of that piece of machinery, they've got to have X number of patients get that test every day. And they write their protocols so that that particular frequency is reflected in the day-to-day -day operations of the hospitals. So as an administrator in the hospital, I had over 100 staff under me that I needed to constantly oversee and evaluate. Now, again, being a nurse administrator, I saw the mistakes that physicians made, the orders that were written, and that were the wrong orders altogether to be written for a patient, wrong diets ordered. They make major mistakes. I saw the mistakes that nurses made, the medication errors. I'll bet half of them were never even reported because it's a fear-based system. Because we get paid to do more, we have huge uh, medical complexes that are geared up to provide more services. If there are more beds available, they'll admit the patient to the hospital. If there are more ICU beds available, they'll transfer the patient to the ICU. Um, if there are more MRI scanners and CT scanners around, then more of those services will be done because doctors like to do more for their patients. And uh, if their patients are insured, the patient generally doesn't care because it doesn't cost them anything. I've watched people come into hospitals and we, we called it the million dollar workup. We wanted to make sure we did as many workup tests as possible in order for us to generate revenue and to really make sure we could diagnose these people well. And then once we diagnosed them, we filled them with our medications. That was mostly our middle-aged people. Once we got to our elderly, that was a whole different ball game. We warehouse them in the hospitals and the acute care settings until we can get them into nursing homes. So the question remains, with all these resources, why are we doing so badly? And the answer, it seems to me, is strikingly clear. We cling to a private insurance system which has a 30 to 32 percent overhead. Overhead is a euphemism for profits, for advertising, marketing, and spectacular salaries to their executives. And of course, huge amounts of monies distributed to their investors. And the end result is 47 million people uninsured, and that means bankruptcy, for example. One out of every two personal bankruptcies in this country are related to medical bills and the associated illness. My people can still end up with insurance policies that leave them with huge deductibles and huge co-pays. They end up either deterred from going and seeking appropriate treatment at an early time when they can really manage it at a more cost-effective way or save their own lives. That's the way the system is set up. The, the health care bill that passed provided reform within the context of a for-profit system. Uh, did it make some progress? Absolutely. I mean, when you tell insurance companies, look, you have to cover young people on their parents' policies up to age 26. You're going to have to cover people if they have pre-existing conditions. That's progress. But the truth of the matter is that there's a reason why America ranks 37th of all countries in the world in terms of the quality of health care, despite the fact that we spend twice per capita. It's because this for-profit system makes health care about bean counting and not about human beings. We made a step in a direction of reforming the for-profit system. But the truth is, we need to set that system aside someday and have health care as a basic right, not a privilege based on ability to pay. Thank you all.
there's just no question that there are injustices, that many people who are underinsured or non-insured are not receiving the type of care that they need. But the problem with the proposed solution, not the proposed, the solution that's passed and is now part of the United States law, is that it perpetuates the same craziness and nonsense that has been going on for decades in the United States, which is actually accelerating and catalyzing uh, the, the, the degenerative diseases in this, in, the, in this country because the focus is on really using drugs as tr symptomatic treatment for, for, for diseases rather than addressing the underlying cause of diseases. Let's look at who's making money in medicine. Third party payers are making about 30% of the healthcare dollar. Uh, the administrative, the moving the money around essentially is very expensive. Um, this is honestly why I'm a believer in um, the British health system, where there's actually a public health system and a private health system. It gives people choice. It gives clinicians choice as to where they want to work. Is it perfect? No. Is it better than where we are? I think so. As far as I know, HMOs are private entities that contract out with Medicare. Basically, they are brokers. If Medicare gives $100 a per patient to a particular HMO for care for that patient for the whole year, you, you would expect at least 90 cents of that money would go to patient care, but I don't see that happening. For an HMO, it is in their interest to hold on to that money because that goes into their pockets. I know health insurance companies and uh, have had a lot of sway, um, and, and they have a gazillion lobbyists right now doing everything they can to sway things in their direction in Washington. I don't like the idea of a corporation deciding uh, how many sessions I should have or how I should be working with any given patient. That not a day goes by that I don't get a rejection for a medication that I felt was in my patient's best interest or a treatment that was rejected by the insurance company and they say we would prefer you to use a different medication or a different screening procedure or a different interventional procedure. I loved what I did for a period of time because I was very good at it and I made a great living doing it. But once that I lost my niece and I really went into the literature and started looking at the clinical data, that's when I got compassionate. That's when I got pissed off because I knew that the manufacturers knew that the drug that my niece committed suicide on was eight to ten times more likely to cause suicidal ideation than placebo in clinical trials. Megan's problems started when she was involved in a car accident. She was literally smashed between two vehicles as she was standing uh, at the driver's side window talking to a friend. She was a base cheerleader. She had a tremendous amount of strength, physical strength, and after the car accident she had difficulty participating in any of the things that she had participated in prior to the accident. And she got depressed. She had been put on several different medications for pain and depression. She was in her first year med school at Indiana University, and she was preparing to take her finals. And she wanted to stay awake uh, in order to study. And she goes to uh, the convenience store and gets ephedra to keep her awake so she can study. I was in Texas and she was um, in Indiana and I get a phone call from her saying, Mom, something's wrong. I can't go take my finals because I can't, uh, I'm hallucinating. Everything is black, white and red and people are flying in the sky. And I said, okay, I'll be there. As soon as I can get a plane, I'll be there. In the meantime, my mom, who lives in Indiana, called Indiana University and said, um, my granddaughter can't attend finals, what do we do? And Indiana University says, well, we require a physician's statement. You'll have to take her to the hospital or the doctor in order for her to be able to take her finals. And so my mom took Megan to the emergency room. The physicians at the emergency room convinced Megan to admit herself to the psych ward and that's where they kept her for a week. I got to the hospital and for three solid days 
they refused to let me see the doctor. My daughter's in the psych ward. She's 18 years old, and of course I'm pleading with them. I need to talk to the doctor. This is, I need to know what's going on. I was treated horribly. They were holding her against her will and drugging her with psych psychiatric drugs, which I now know was so much more lucrative for the hospital than had they left her in the emergency room, which would have resulted in just an overnight stay because she truly was having a drug reaction. Megan was very astute and she said, Mom, it's the drugs, the drugs that they put me on that's causing this. Unfortunately, we didn't know that all we had to do was to give written notice that she wanted to be released and that's all she needed to do and we were begging for them to let her go because we knew that her mental condition was declining it wasn't getting better and it was causing really bizarre behavior that we'd never seen before i was able to finally talk to the doctor on the last day um, he said your daughter's bipolar and uh, you know, she'll need to be on these psych drugs for the rest of her life. If you look at the advertisement for drugs and pharmaceuticals on the TV stations, it's a pretty penny. It's a fair percentage of their revenue. And for them to speak out or even um, broadcast news that would in any way alienate or damage the credibility of the largest advertiser is simply foolish. This monopoly of conventional medicine has been propagandized by our mainstream media. You know, the media is supposed to question things. It's supposed to be skeptical. It's supposed to ask the questions as a proxy for the public. But when it comes to conventional medicine and especially vaccines, the media is blowing the horn of the pharmaceutical industry. As an award-winning journalist, I'm very upset at the practices I see going on in reporting today when it comes to reporting the actual causes of disease in the American public. And I find that journalists uh, are accepting press releases, they're accepting public relations rather than reading the actual science. The direct-to-consumer ads are another area that are incredibly inappropriate. There are only two, two countries in the world that allow direct-to-consumer ads, New Zealand and the United States. They spend five billion dollars a year on direct-to-consumer ads to try and convince you that the products that they're selling are products that you need. The medical industry doesn't call what it does propaganda, it calls it advertising. It shows healthy people and it shows healthy people doing healthy things. But in the background there's this message to tell you that this drug is very dangerous. Your teeth may fall out, your bones may crack, and you may develop cancer. However, this drug is going to be really good for what we're telling you. So the American people have to take their risk because now the pharmaceutical industry can absolve themselves because they can say, well, you knew the risk, but you took the drug anyway. And the connection between our, uh, our uh, human anxieties and this pseudo solution, which is the product that you're supposed to buy, which will solve that for you, is the big lie. And it's told over and over and over again. It's one of the principal things that has gotten us into this mess. There were many mistakes with the health care reform that went into place. Number one, they forgot to talk about vitamins and nutrients and how we prevent disease. And then secondly, they took away more freedoms. So we used to have more freedom of choice as consumers and parents and even as cities and states. They took much of that away, and they forced people into a monopoly system, a system that's broken. It does not work except to create profits for the companies that benefit from disease and suffering. The Health Care Reform Act, like all of the governmental regulatory structures in place, it puts a stranglehold over medical innovation. We have the federal government coming in and telling doctors what they're allowed to do. It restricts patients from choosing therapies that may be more efficacious. We're not doing health care reform. We're doing insurance reform right now. We're talking about the economics of medicine. 
We need not only to give everybody health insurance because health insurance or health care because it's a right. It's not a privilege, it's a right. Everybody deserves health care. But it's insufficient to make the health care system work because it isn't a health care system at all. It's a disease care system. We have to shift the paradigm. There are the, the financial, structural aspects of paradigm change. Um, healthcare systems that there's one insurer, the Canadian system would be, would be one version of that. A private and a public system such as the British health system. A very socialized system such as the French system. These all allow for different delivery payment structures and in that case greater availability of medical care um, regardless of the paradigm that you're delivering it under to the particular patient or the population. People at insurance companies are looking at their bottom line and recognizing that the way that they can maximize profits is to purvey through doctors the least effective, mostly least expensive treatment. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the arguments to achieve universal health coverage uh, have not worked. Um, in fact, since Teddy Roosevelt tried to achieve universal coverage in the States, um, we failed uh, every time. What happened the day Meg committed suicide was Meg had taken her shoestrings and tried to hang herself from the ceiling fan. And the ceiling fan came down on top of her head. She carried the ceiling fan out to the garage and came back into the house and took an oil lamp and poured it on top of her head and set herself on fire. And when she did that, she called 911 and immediately got into the shower, which was the worst thing that she could have done. She was standing on the, on the lawn waiting for them to get there. She had third degree burns over 90% of her body. Um, she had to be cremated. We're seeing our practitioners are being attacked for practicing outside the standard of medical care when they offer dietary supplements or natural health approaches to health and healing. We're seeing our industry members being attacked, for example, by the FDA being told to pull products from the market. We're seeing consumers really perpetually being kept in the dark because the information that they can access about the benefits of a natural health approach are so totally limited by current law. So much of what's been going on is kept under wraps because practitioners are forced to sign consent decrees behind closed doors. The FDA will threaten and coerce them. They have sort of a large hammer, enforcement hammer, they'll hold up and therefore these companies don't oftentimes come out and share publicly what's been going on. The mechanisms of communications about the alternatives are blocked. The uh, framework of passing laws about the uh, alternatives, to, let's say create a preventive health policy, are blocked. All of this is, creates an, in, an individual who's at the end of an information and power system that gives them a very, very limited number of choices. AMA is the foundation of allopathic medicine. Prior to that, we practiced homeopathic medicine, and there were three times as many homeopaths as allopaths. What we need is, yes, we need reform. We need to understand that allopathy, homeopathy can exist, that naturopathy can exist, that registered dietitians, that uh, clinical nutritionists, that massage therapists, that acupuncturists, acupressurists, all of these modalities have a place in medicine. And wouldn't it be perfect to make it a partnership of medicine? So I did a little research and I discovered that homeopathy used to be taught in medical schools all across the United States. Well, you certainly wouldn't find it there now. It's considered very alternative and, and very suspect by mainstream medical people. But the fact is that it was capitalist business interests that made offers to medical schools across the land to move all of medical education into drug-based medicine education. And that's what we're faced with today, with huge pharmaceutical conglomerates 
that get away with breaking the law, that are considered authorities, that can convince doctors to use their products, even when they know that their products have high risks associated with them, because it was set up as a healthcare business. You are being dictated to. You must choose chemotherapy. You can't choose an alternative system of healing. You can't even choose to let your own body heal itself. You have to choose their system, or if you're a parent and you have a child with cancer, for example, you could be arrested. You could have your child taken from you by Child Protective Services simply because you do not believe in the system of toxic chemicals that conventional medicine uses to treat cancer today. We live in a world that has about a 6,000 year history of empire building mode. That's the economic and political mode that humans have been in for that long a time. It is in the business of building hierarchies that command and control everything below them. I'm an evolution biologist, so I look at healthy living systems, and healthy living systems are holarchies, kind of like uh, onion skins or Russian nested dolls where living systems exist within each other. Every one of you are up to 100 trillion cells as part of the negotiations, and the whole thing functions beautifully like a highly evolved ecosystem. And when you have hierarchical social systems, it almost forces lying and deception because there's the whole problem of keeping yourself in power. 150 million people now are buying out of the, the dominant, mechanistic, materialistic health system and going into natural alternatives, organic foods, and so forth. If we had a national policy, for example, that promoted uh, a natural health food approach, biodynamic or organic approach, as a part of national policy, we could improve the health of people in this country enormously. Speaking from my own experience with alternative medicine, uh, as a young person, I suffered uh, from a very serious case of Crohn's disease. Uh, in 1995, I switched my diet to a vegan diet. And that, together with Chinese medicine, enabled me to be virtually free of any symptoms of Crohn's whatsoever. Preventive medicine uh, is another version of an interesting paradigm. Can I, can I prevent diseases? Can I, can I work with a patient long term and prevent diseases? The uh, old Chinese system of medicine was based on that. When the patient got ill, you actually made less money as a physician than if you kept the patient out of the hospital. Whether it's in yoga science or, or forms of meditation and proper diet and lifestyle, all of this to break the dominance of an ego-based culture that is taking us down, disintegrating us, and causing our medical vast medical problems. As long as we, we think that everything can be fixed by mechanical fixers, by mechanical I mean of artificial fixers, then we'll turn to physical means, to chemical means, then we'll end up by spoiling our life because we become dependent on the, we'll, we'll end up by spoiling our environment because we are overloading it with artificial, unnecessary uh, synthetic materials. And until we break the hold that the pharmaceutical companies and the insurance companies have on our political process, it's going to be very difficult to be able to get, to permit individual Americans to feel the fullness of their own individual power to be able to determine the path for their own health. What we are doing, building uh, public opinion in favor of an upheaval, a paradigm shift of not only medicine, but also entire scientific system, this, I think, eventually will bear fruit. And until the value system and the worldview begin to change from one in which we see ourselves as separate from each other and from the environment, from the natural uh, processes of healing and correction, then we're not going to be able to build a model of medicine that's truly about promotion of healing and the integrity of our wholeness. If everybody learned how to alter their attention and recharge their energy, and release stress so it doesn't accumulate right down to their DNA, because there's good evidence of that now. If people learned how to deal with their own minds and their negative emotions and make their mind fresh every moment and in the present, by the time they were 12, this would be a really different society. This is the guts of what the indigenous healer did. 
They looked at body, mind, emotion, spirit, and they spent time. They did what they had to do to be with people because they're important. And if they're important, that's what you must do or they won't heal. Neither will you. All over the world, there are systems of medicine and there are healing practitioners in place right now in other countries who are getting amazing results with nutritional therapies. They're really using ancient systems that are also timeless because healing and nutrition is a timeless concept and it cannot be censored forever. It cannot be put out of the way. It cannot be ignored. It cannot be shut down. Healing is part of you. Healing is inside you. We have to watch out for the fact that a medical science world doing marvelously well with a mechanistic model is still uh, missing the most important parts of the piece. There are just a few areas where uh, mind-body connection has been acknowledged by medicine. The placebo effect, uh, the power of prayer. Now there's more and more appreciation by the scientific establishment that prayer accelerates healing. NIH, or NIMH, has recently included some money to study using advanced scientific tools higher order stages of consciousness. That's amazing. We now understand through science the interrelationships of the mind and the body and the role of thoughts and feelings in our cellular life. It's actually 180 degrees different than the allopathic model. And if we feed the body with the proper thoughts, which is a form of nutrition, we can really start to move into a true holistic model of creating health. We'll become creative, we'll change our lifestyle, we'll change our economics, we'll change our health procedure, but it has to come from a groundswell of popular movement. Everything you do, the smallest cause, can produce a huge change in the outcome. So it melts down here and it's going to firm up over here. And when it's in the process of firming over, up over here, that's when you can meddle with it a little bit for better or worse, try to improve your chances of survival in the outcome in the new system. If we are going to lead health alive, we have to reestablish our coherence. You have to recognize that all coherence has to do with the coherence that we have with others around us and with the environment. We have to regain harmony. That, I think, is the key. After being taken off 20 pharmaceutical drugs 16 months ago, Cheryl Knight is improving. Cheryl continues her recovery with the help of her husband, Dave, in Washington State. It's just someone's actually listening. That just, doesn't that amazing? Someone's actually listening. Yeah. <laughs>